Well, good morning, conference. It's absolutely brilliant to be here among friends and colleagues, reflecting on what we've done so far, but also what we've got left to do and the work ahead of us. In this last four years, this government has met Britain's problems head on. We've delivered real solutions and real reform. We've kept this country together, secure and strong. And above all, this government has delivered an economic plan under George Osborne that's seen as leapfrog the world in rates of productivity and growth. I'm proud, proud of what our government under this Prime Minister has achieved. I'm proud because, as usual, we have achievements that we can point to on the doorstep in May that we know voters will recognise. As usual, it takes our country, our con it takes the Conservatives and our country to put our country back together again. And I can tell you, it's no different in my department. Under Labour, we had an aid programme that stretched across 43 countries, including Russia and China, with officials, not ministers, signing off multi-million pound programmes, too often delivering poor value for taxpayer m money. Well, that's no longer true. It's changed under this government. We now target our aid to 28 countries. We have proper business cases, ministerial sign-off by fantastic ministers like Desmond Swain, independent scrutiny of our spend, and critically, we now focus much, much more on jobs and on economic growth, the very things that help countries to help themselves. Of course, I know that international development and the promise that we made on it have been controversial for some. But I don't think anyone can look at the world today and believe that Britain should have a foreign policy that just muddles through, hoping that as the world's problems stack up one on top of the other, we can just pretend that they don't exist and that they won't affect us. We need to tackle these overseas problems head on, just as we tackle Britain's challenges head on, which is why international development and our commitment to 0.7% is not an optional extra or an afterthought. It's a vital component of Britain's global toolkit alongside diplomacy and defence for shaping that world around us. And today, Philip Hammond, Michael Fallon and I work closely on many challenges across many operational theatres. Take ISIL. We've seen it rampaging across Syria and Iraq, murdering Muslims and Christians alike. When I was in Baghdad last month, I saw the vital work being done by our ambassador and his team to support the Iraqi government. And when thousands of Yazidis were trapped on Mount Sinjar over the summer in August, it was DFID emergency relief airdrop from Royal Air Force Hercules aircraft that kept those people alive. In northern Iraq, I met displaced Iraqis now living in the grounds of a church and a tented camp, people who had fled with nothing, but at least had a canvas roof and food thanks to Great Britain. The conflict across the border in Syria has led to millions of refugees, which is placing an incredible strain on countries like Jordan and Lebanon, further destabilizing an already unstable region. Our humanitarian efforts there are sensibly helping those countries avoid buckling under the strain of millions of migrants. People who'd rather be getting on with their lives at home, not uprooting their families, but they've had no choice if they want to stay safe. Our support for education provision for Syrian refugee children in Lebanon and Jordan means that if and when these young Syrians return home, they'll have a better chance of earning a decent living in productive jobs rather than, rather than falling prey to extremism and violence. If we want them to be able to rebuild their country, we have to make sure they have that basic education, even though they're refugees. And we cannot afford a lost generation of Syrian children. In West Africa, British humanitarian workers, soldiers and diplomats 
are working hard against an invisible threat. Ebola is one of the most serious threats facing the world today, with estimates of up to 1.4 million people infected by January next year if we don't act. So an international coalition is working together to contain Ebola and to defeat it. Britain, the US and France have each agreed to step in and assist Sierra Leone, Liberia and Guinea respectively. Right now, across Sierra Leone, teams of DFID humanitarian workers and Royal Engineers are overseeing the construction of Ebola treatment centres. During the coming months, the UK will treble the number of Ebola treatment beds and work to make sure that alongside the government of Sierra Leone, we're boosting public health, community awareness, the things that can combat the spread of this disease. And we all know that it would be absolutely catastrophic if we allowed Ebola to spread unchecked. All of these places, Iraq, Syria, West Africa, they're not a distant threat. They're just a five, six hour plane ride away. The same time it might take some of us to get home from conference door to door. So these are the kinds of humanitarian challenges that we face. But I don't think I can talk about our responses to these crises without mentioning the people, many of them Brits, who risk their lives and sometimes lose them in dangerous, sometimes nightmarish places. In 2013, 155 aid workers were killed. 171 were seriously wounded. 134 were kidnapped, including David Haynes and Alan Henning. And I want to pay tribute to David and Alan and to the many others who do amazing work, including my own staff in DFID. <laughs> Hundreds of our doctors and nurses have also volunteered to go to Sierra Leone to staff our health facilities there. An incredible display of courage and selflessness. British medics were in Gaza this summer and reaching remote islands in the Philippines courtesy of the Royal Navy following the devastating typhoon there last November. Theirs is the spirit of the firefighter running into the burning building when everyone else is running in the opposite direction. We should recognize that and we should be proud of them. We should be proud of our country because we don't walk on by. So Britain's response to humanitarian emergencies sets us apart from so many other countries. And so does some of our fantastic longer term development work. After more than four years of conservative leadership, Britain does international development better and more efficiently than ever before. My department continues to win awards for procurement, ensuring that the money goes where it's needed. And being an accountant and a former economic secretary to the Treasury, I wouldn't have it any other way. In Tanzania, we are working with the government there to improve that country's ability to have the capital markets that it needs to trade with British and international companies. And British experts from the London Stock Exchange are helping to develop Tanzania's nascent stock market. In Pakistan, we have HMRC staff helping that gov government collect more tax and spend that revenue more effectively. In Somalia, we're strengthening the country's ability to take on terrorists al-Shabaab who still threaten instability in the region. And it was Britain that hosted the very first girl summit in July to end FGM and child and forced marriage in a generation, both here and around the world. And I want to thank my summit co-host, Theresa May, along with UNICEF and all the NGOs and those inspirational young people that made that event such an amazing success. Thank you. We've also ramped up our work on what the Prime Minister calls the golden thread of development, 
the absence of conflict, property rights, rule of law, women's rights, the foundation stones of development in any country. That includes a greater focus on jobs and economic growth. Yes, Britain isn't the only country that needs a long-term economic plan. And when these countries graduate out of extreme poverty and become our trading partners, we end our aid programs for good. All of this work across the globe costs us one and a half pence in every one pound of public spending. And it's a choice. It's a choice of what we think is better. Either Britain standing back in a world with unstable countries that find it hard to prevent themselves becoming a breeding ground for terrorism, radicalization, that then gets aimed at us, or we can be a Britain working to support stable, developed countries that we can trade with, create jobs with, have shared prosperity with. It actually is that simple in the end. We work in tough places, often dangerous places, on the things that can save lives and then move things forward. And it makes sense for both these countries and Britain too. So the next time that someone rubbishes Britain's responsibilities and our work overseas, stand up for what we are doing. Let's be proud that we're there protecting the lives of families fleeing ISIL. Let's be proud that we're supporting British volunteers working to contain Ebola. Let's be proud that we're rebuilding Afghanistan following the sacrifices of our brave servicemen and women. Let's be proud for wanting our great Britain to be able to hold its head up high in this world and for being a country that's prepared to get involved rather than stand aside or look the other way. Let's be proud for doing what is both right and absolutely in our national interest. Because it's only this party that is building Great Britain back up again after the dark days of Labour. It's this party that has taken the tough decisions and choices at home that have kept our country together and strong. And when it comes to the wider world, it's this Conservative Party that's best placed to help Britain face that world of uncertainty and turmoil, to keep us safe and prosperous, and to secure a better future. Thank you. Thank you very much.